It was one of the strangest auctions ever held. It was the estate of one man, Brother Greg, who had all the money in the world, but had spent years living in darkness, loneliness, and isolation. It was only toward the end of his life that he finally had hope. But he had no heir, he had no wife. And it was during the Korean War that he used all of his money and his influence to keep his son from going to war. But having failed, his son ended up in combat. And then he got the letter that no parent ever wants to get. And it drove him into a dark, depressing life. He spiraled downward. His far-flung enterprise meant nothing. It's funny thing about life. Look at me. It's easy how overnight life can suddenly mean nothing. Your money will mean nothing. It'll mean nothing. And so there he was, broken. Huge house. Only one there was him and his servants. And he lost the only thing in the world he ever wanted was his son. And one day, when it got unbearable, a package arrived at his house. It was about, it was flat, about this wide, about as tall as I am. And he opened it. And it was a stunning portrait of his son in his army uniform. It was exact. It was so real and so wonderful that it took his breath away. So then after that day, it hung in the great hall over the fireplace. That was the trophy of the house. And then he died. Some years later, he passed away. There's an auction. He's got jewelry. He's got antiques. He's got handmade rugs. He's got treasures. Everything from a mink vase to a Louis XIV chair. And it's all up for auction. And the auctioneer's got the gavel. And he said, what's my bid for this vase? And suddenly, after uh, three items, they put this picture of his son on an easel. And he said, what is my bid for this picture? Nobody knew the artist. It was, and the note from the artist said, your son helped save my freedom. And I, I am a portrait artist from South Korea. And I painted this, hoping that it would bring you some comfort. But nobody in the audience knew. None of the collectors, nobody knew. And so the auctioneer said, what is my bid for this painting? Nobody offered anything. The gardener, who happened to be walking by, stormed into the hall and said, I knew that boy since he was a child. He said, I, all I've got is $100. And I'm going to bid $100 for that painting. I want it. And he got it. And as soon as he got it, the auctioneer began pounding the gavel over and over and over and said, this auction for the cars and the house and the land, it's over. And the people were in outrage. And they said, we came here to bid on this. He said, you don't understand. The will said... Whoever bought this painting would get everything else. <laughs> Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not along with him also freely give us all things? I'm not mad at modern preaching because it compromises. I'm not mad at modern preaching because it's light on sin and thin on repentance. I'm mad because we have lost the greatest treasure we could have ever known. When you get saved and you get Jesus, you get everything else.
This writing device that Paul employed is called a syllogism. It is in a suppressed premise. And I want you to understand how it works. Sometimes if you leave words out, it makes it stronger. Psalm 23 should say, Because the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But it draws an inevitable, powerful conclusion. And it says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I don't need to explain anything more. So Paul is using this in the form of a question. Sometimes the most powerful way to answer a question is with another one. The other night somebody said to me, would you like to eat some Mexican food tonight? I said, are there mustaches in Mexico? You know, if your last name is Murillo, you can get away with that. Now look at me. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not, along with him also, freely give us all things? How will he not save the people you put on a name for us to pray for? Your son, your daughter, your loved ones. The Bible says the seed of the righteous shall be redeemed. How will he not hear the mother's cry for her son in prison to be born again? How will he ignore your cry? Some of you are sitting in this room and you believe that you now live in a twilight zone. A, a day where it doesn't matter. The best days are behind you. Are you kidding me? Say, Mar, I'm getting old. I'm getting ready to gum applesauce at leisure world. No, no, no. If they try to put you in a rest home, fold up your walker and beat them off with it. God has a miracle for you yet. Help me somebody. You might be a young woman looking for a husband. That right man is there. And you don't have to kiss a bunch of frogs to get to a Prince Charming. He who spared not his own son. Do you think if he put his own son on the cross, he doesn't have the right man for you to marry? Or the right woman for you to marry? You think, pastor, that the debt on your building is going to swallow up the work of God? I need some help right now. I'm trying to stir you. You know, I told you. Last night I told you I came to San Diego to start a fight. Tonight I've come to start a riot. That's right. When the questions hammer against your spirit and say, will God heal my body? Will God intervene in my situation? Will God save my family? Heaven thunders, how will he not? You see, look at me. The devil can tell you you don't deserve it. The devil can tell you that God won't do it. But you have got to see one thing and one thing alone. It's the one thing that drives the message more than any other thing. The cross. The cross. The cross, devil, he put his own son on the cross. He did not just get whipped and beaten and pierced for my soul to be saved, but for my body to be healed. And by his stripes, I am healed. And when, the, when your spirit rises up and says it can't happen, And you say, will God, will God protect my church, protect my family, give us wisdom in this dark hour in American history? Will God not stop the agenda of the wicked coming out of Washington, D.C.? How will he not? Because America, like Israel, 
is a nation of covenant, is a land of covenant. There's something in our dirt that is sanctified. There's something in us. Don't you know God is going to show up and turn this country around?